our definition of co-production is in the next slide. Thank you, Michelle. She's very busy today, Michelle. So we're going to be stressing her with lots of asking her to move things on. Um, so I don't know whether you can read that. It looks a little bit strange on my screen. So I'll read it out for you. So we worked with um, young people, children and families and ourselves as a group of, of co-production um, people to look at what our uh, definition should be and we came up with co-production happens when all voices are actively listened to from the start of the planning process this involves a mutual respect for each other's views with an open and honest relationship that's transparent and continually evolving to achieve meaningful and positive outcomes so that's where we've kind of started and we make sure that that definition um, is introduced and put into every single work stream around children with send um, that it sits within all our policies, all our operating procedures, so that we all have a mutual understanding of what co-production is. Um, for those of you who are a little bit newer to co-production, I have put, uh, the next slide is about the participation ladder. So this is kind of where we started really in thinking about where we were as an organisation. I'll talk a little bit about our journey in the next slide. But this is the ladder of participation. And at the bottom of the ladder is kind of coercion and educating. And at the top of the ladder is co-production. And you can see from the right hand side that what we're trying to do when we're working with families is that co production and co-design so it's an equal and reciprocal partnership and there's some things in the middle that we'll always have to do so you know um as as children's nurses as doctors will always at times have to do for people there'll always be that need for that and there is sometimes a need to do too but actually they should be really rare occasions and about saving people's lives and, and keeping people very safe what we're aiming for is always to work at the top of this ladder so in terms of our journey, for those of you who haven't been on the journey with us, I know there's some people here that might not be from Stockport. Um, we had our um, Ofsted and CQC inspection of our SEND services back in September 2018, so two years ago. Cast your mind back to a world, no pandemic. We'd never heard of COVID. SARS was around, but we didn't have COVID. Um, and from that inspection we got something called a written statement of action so a WISO if you hear us talking about WISOs and one of the key actions in that was that we needed to co-produce with families and that word with is really important and it's both about working with families but also about us as professional groups working together as well so there's co-production that happens across all of those so social care education health the voluntary sector should also work together around a family as well as engaging and co-producing with those families and it was quite a strong message for us to say that in Stockport we weren't doing that well enough um, and that was a message that came very strongly from our families so we had to, we you know right absolutely rightly listen to that out of that we set up a send board and and the reason that I was involved and I'm continue to be involved is is that I co-chair the co-production work stream so to develop our actions to deliver on those actions we set up some work streams co-production being one of the, the overarching um both principles but workshops and we had a number of key things to do you know get the definition right um, decide how we'd hear the voices of children and young people we'll hear later about champions that was one of our key actions and one of our really big um, uh, things that we had to do was produce the, the charter so you can see 2019 we agreed our culture you'll see our stockport hats um representation and we'll show you that later on when we do the menti piece of work that was a really key piece of work with young people to produce work in workshops to say what should this look like um in October, we've done a lot of work and obviously interrupted slightly by the pandemic. We had a lot of workshops late last year, beginning of this year, where we sort of took the charter out. There was a little bit of feedback and some of your par parents might be with us today that were involved in that about using the term co-production. And I think we've had a real debate about whether we should change the title. On balance, we've kept it, I think because it's nationally recognised, but also because it's something that we've worked with for two years. But obviously, this is an ongoing feedback and piece of work. So it may be that in the future, our charter becomes something different. It becomes about a title that describes working well together, 
um, rather than being co-production because I think for some people that's still a term that they're not quite as familiar with and that might be an interesting thing to talk about later. So we're in November, we're launching the charter and um, we're committed to it being a charter for working well together with families and professionals and what the future looks like really is about what the strategic priorities will be, how we'll work co-productively with parents, carers, young people and other partners. And the idea around this is improving service planning, design, delivery and review. So what we don't want co-production to be is simplistic. We want it to be everything. So we have over the last two years recruited people. So uh, Michelle's with us. She was recruited by a, a panel that included parent reps and um, we recruited our new head of midwifery with our um, service users on the panel. Um, so I think it's things like that that we want to do as well as if we're reviewing a policy, we need to make sure that the families are and the young people are cited on that. Um, obviously moving forward from our, our current position, we've had to think really hard about how we do that. Things like this are really helpful, aren't they, using Zoom platforms. So what is the charter, I suppose, and what's it about? And, and the charter is about creating a culture. And, and these are the headlines that, that everybody told us, um, all the families told us, all the children told us, that they wanted us to be open and honest, to actively listen, to value that lived experience. So we're not experts as professionals. You know, we don't live this experience every day. Do what matters. So that's really important. What matters to each person and young person and child individually is important. Be accountable and responsive. And responsive is really important to people, isn't it? That not only are we accountable for what we do, but that we act responsively, quickly, in a timely manner. That we'll work together and we'll be respectful. And that's across all of us. That's respectful between professionals. It's respectful between parents and professionals and between professionals and other agencies. So what we're going to do now is, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Michelle, if that's all right, Michelle, is this is our hats uh, uh, picture. As you can see, it's got all of those things we've just been through, all of those, those um, cultural things demonstrated as hats. The young people really like the hats. You can't imagine the amount of debate we had about what hats to use to be right and and. Uh, so they're the hats. It's hats because it's Stockport. And for those of you who don't know Stockport, Stockport was centre of the hat making industry. Um, we still have a hat museum. And when the, the uh, pandemic is open, please come and visit it. Um, it's very interesting. It had a lovely cafe. But the hats are there to demonstrate all of the things that we want to do and how we'll work together. So I'll hand over to Michelle. And Michelle's going to take us through a little bit of an interactive session. Hi everyone, thanks Claire. So I'm just um, going to ask you all if you've got your smartphones with you or if you can access another machine, if you can go to menti.com in your web browser and enter the code. Whilst you're doing that, I'm just going to swap the screen share so that we can look at the results as they come in on screen. You'll start to see the questions in a second. Everybody all right so far with that? Are you all right? I, your initial thing will say, question is not open. Oh, there you go. Let's just move back onto the first one. Apologies. Okay, will you just give me a quick wave for those of you that are on camera, if you can now see your Menti screen and the question. Okay. Yep. Yep, lovely. Okay, so first question, how would you rate co-production now from your perspective? So thinking about what Claire's just said in relation to those values. Oh, Claire, do you want to come in? No, it's fine, thank you. No, sorry, Claire Guayas. Oh, all right, sorry. Oh, are you? Hands up, Claire. I'm sorry, that was a wave to say, yeah, uh, I'm on. I'm oh, on thank sorry. you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so yeah, thinking about what Claire said about those values, the active listening, being open and honest, um, the accountability and respect, just in relation to your own perspective, and this can be as a parent carer, or it can be as a professional, because as Claire said, this is a 360 degree set of principles, no matter who you are within a process or systems, we should all be observing these behaviours, and we should all feel like they are being observed with us. So either put your hat, parent carer hat on or your professional hat and just say how you feel co-production 
looks from your perspective at the minute. One obviously being not so good, five being great. And what we normally see here when we ask people is a bit of a mixture of responses. So we find that some people feel in respect of delivering co-production, they might not be as strong as they would like to be. And in terms of receipt of co-production, not as strong as they would like to be. But we do find that there are some real pockets of good practice. Um, and this can be right across all areas. It doesn't matter whether it's health, care, social care, uh, education settings. There are very mixed experiences right across the borough. And what we're hoping to do with the charter is to make sure that we try and embed this as practice right across the board so that everybody could pick up that poster and say, I recognise all of these behaviours in the in the way that I work with my school, my GP surgery, uh, whether that's up at the hospital. A question. Of course you can. Hiya. Hiya. Um, I was just um, would be interested to hear a little bit more about how you came to the definition that you've created of co-production. I know you said that you worked with a lot of young people and families, mm. just in terms of logistics of how you um, delivered sessions around that or what, what kind of tools you use to get to that get to that definition. OK, so uh, obviously we were in the days when we could all sit in a room together. So it was a very early days, really. I think we initially started with a kind of quite a tight group with parent reps on. And some of our uh, so we obviously worked with what were then pet pips but packs but one of the other things that the DFE fed back to us is we needed to broaden our parent representation rather than working very narrowly with with one group so we had groups like Autisk um, and quite a lot of other groups that we initially went round and we did a lot of work like you know like the word cloud things you know finding the keywords that needed to be in a, a definition I think I have to be honest, I thought my initial, um, we looked at things like what the Council for Disabled Children's um, work is, what how they define it. There's a lot of national definitions. Some are one sentence, some are very wordy. I think we've landed somewhere in the middle. Um, and I think really key for our, for our young people was that bit that starts it off about actively listening. So I think what the young people told us, and we worked a lot with kind of, you know, that young teens um, group was about actively listening. And, and it's from that very early stage. So that was why we started with that, really. And you'll see a lot of other definitions that are more, they kind of start towards the end of our, our definition. And I think our definition ends with that continually evolving because I think I don't see co-production as a start and end piece of work. Mm. My vision as chairing the group, if I'm honest, was we wouldn't keep it going forever because what it should become is business as usual. Mm. So I shouldn't need a standalone work stream for co-production. It should be so yeah. embedded into our, our everyday business and what we do that you don't need something that says, oh, this is what we do. It's a bit like having a group for um, being kind, isn't it? Although yeah. sometimes we could do with that. Um, so... <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know whether that helps, but it was really a lot of workshops and a lot of using word clouds. You know, um, we did some sessions with talking mats. Have you heard of talking mats? Our speech and language therapists use talking mats for young people who probably haven't got the language skills. Um, so just a lot of that very early work. Mm. And were those mixed sessions? Did you do them or did you just do young people in one session, parents and staff separately? Or did you do a kind of collaborative you know more mixed groups I suppose mm. that's a really good question actually my vision initially was completely mixed but the feedback we got from young people is they found that a bit daunting similarly yeah. I really wanted a young person on our co-production work stream but I think most young people understandably would find that quite daunting yeah. so instead what we did was we set, we set up that kind of expert reference group for young people so the work we did with young people was absolutely to them with some um using things like talking mats using our therapists using some of our specialist stuff but our parents and professionals were very mixed right. pretty, our work stream is pretty 50 50 to be fair um parent reps and and professionals right claire, I've, got, I've got another question hello what ian role, it's nice to see you and you claire what role do you see for the third sector in terms of delivering the charter 
I think a, a, yeah, a really big role to be fair. I mean, we're very lucky, as you know, in Stockport, we've got some really engaged, you know, um, third sector space artists, our PACTS partners. That was what Pips have changed their name in, just in yeah. case you didn't recognise it. So I think they are, I would say, at least um, thir a third of our partnership is, is that third sector. Um, I definitely think looking around our work streams, they are very, very well represented. So I think they've got a real role because often they have access to groups and um, channels of communication that we, we can't get to. Because we're, we're looking to hopefully appoint to two participation workers at the Trust. Yeah. And so yeah. we think That's it's Michelle's really important. Job. Yeah. Which we My really think is important to kind of align with what Stockport is actually doing because we're in Stockport, of course. Yes. Yeah, that and they, those participation was would be brilliantly welcome in our work. We had a conversation this morning, Deborah Woodcock and I, after the um, work stream leads about how we start to use technology to get some. Uh, of that feedback so picking up on Rebecca's issue you know we are really struggling at the moment aren't we? we can't sit in a room with people so how do we use technology how do we make sure that we don't stop getting that feedback um, and, and roles like Michelle's were brilliant and if you if you employed someone they could just join our group It'd be fantastic Michelle how's it going it's not going very well Claire so I've abandoned the menti with apologies and I've just put in the chat window perhaps we use that as the function instead so thinking about that question on the menti how you would rate co-production from your perspective at this point in time on a scale of one to five one being not so good and five being great if you could just all just pop that number into the chat window and then I can take that away as I would have done in the menti screen and then we'll do something similar around three words that you would think might improve co-production for you, what you think is needed to improve co-production around either your practice or who you work with. Okay, so we've got straight away some threes coming in there, a lot of threes coming in there, um, which is right down the middle of the road, of course, reflecting that we probably have mm. some mixed practice in different areas and I'm not sure whether people are thinking of one particular area as they're doing this or whether they think it's um, across the board because obviously we often look at our services as multi-agency it's about one child but several services around that child perhaps if we're a parent carer um, three but need to embed into business as usual that's a good point Ian I think um, that reflects as well around some pockets of good practice and they may pop up in places but actually not be what's happening across the board all the time and I think Deborah Woodcock's one of her sort of most common phrases is on purpose all the time and that that really should reflect how we are with co-production as well and um, some slightly lower marks here from Katie and Paul around co-production it would be interesting to um, look at the responses in relation to the three words that you think might improve co-production when you reflected on those numbers just to see what it is that would bring them up for you so if you could all start to type in three words that you think would improve co-production from your perspective at this point in time um, and it might help us just to balance because we need to look across the area at what our offer is to staff as well to our workforce in all settings to enable them to do co-production well with parents, carers and children and young people, because um, it's not necessarily um, the easiest practice, depending on what your profession is, you can feel very constrained by rules, regulations, laws that you think make you have to work in a very particular way in order to meet those points of law to do your job well. But actually, there are still ways of working around those rules and regulations that still are very person centred and bring out for the for the family what they actually need in the process which is that person-centered um, approach to meeting the needs of the child because at the end of the day no matter what the statute around your job that's probably why you're doing it it's about meeting the needs of the child okay so we've got words coming in here around visibility trust and innovation honesty openness and trust visibility trust and innovation listening more to parents and children important essential trust time to talk time would be a lovely thing mm, I like lovely, that lovely thing. Mm. yeah trust is such a big thing isn't it and it came out a lot around when we were talking to people around that trust and I think you know what as a 
as a professional, I think it goes across trust of each other as well. So I think what Michelle was saying, you know, that we need to trust each other. I need to trust social care. I need to trust education. They need to trust health. And we all have our own little kind of areas, don't we, that we think, you know, that we... Um, that, that we know about each other, but often we don't. So part of our work is to understand each other, that respect, engagement, talking, I think is really important. So there's some great words, aren't they? Definitely, sharing information. That's a really, really common theme. Um, and what we're hearing a lot from parent carers is that reports are written about children, never shared with the parent mm. carers. We don't know whether the child was involved in, in, in writing the content for that report. So yeah. There are lots of areas that um, we need to improve on. So what I'll do is take all these um, as feedback and we will feed them into our processes to, to help train um, across the workforce and just to build that understanding of how people feel. And hopefully if you were to come back in six months time in our next send week of action when we do a co-production webinar, <laughs> uh, we would see those scores start to go up. And some of those words perhaps change as the scores go up, the context for what needs to improve beyond that, again, may well change. So thank you very much for all your input on that and hand back to Claire. Lovely. Thank you very much. They're really useful. And what we might do is take those words and put them into a bit of a word cloud and see how they how they look. I mean, I have to say, this, I, I think three is probably a fair I would put through I didn't engage in it thought I didn't want to 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 get involved um but I think three is about right you know I think we are further on than we were but I don't think we're anywhere near four or five and that's probably realistic so so I think that's really helpful to see that I'm not far off in how I think things are so what I'll do is move us on just to have a little look at some of the the work we've done um so we did uh, we've talked a little bit about the workshops we did we had a really useful opportunity to work with an artist who's worked with the council before um, and with with some of our um with pacts to sort of almost write and uh, illustrate the work we were doing so this was a this was a workshop we did specifically on the charter um and the artist helped us with how um, those hats would link to all of those headings so this is just really to demonstrate some of the work we've done and obviously what we're working with sometimes is um, young people who aren't um, aren't able to understand they might need some easy read they might really and some very young children who we'd want to have those hats turned into something realistic so I particularly like the fireman one under keep safe you know um that actually not only is that a hat but we can demonstrate there's a kind of hose there as well so there's that and then the next slide kind of looks a little bit around how our tree links with that and those of you that haven't been involved along the way the tree if you zoom in on it is the fingerprints of the children who were involved in one of our workshops so they actually did fingerprints and and then one of our young people designed the tree with the fingerprints as the leaves so that's been really powerful for us and I think we just keep need to keep telling the story of that so that we remember uh, and the framework that we're building around what our outcome should be for young people is around these domains around the charter and around what culture we want to build. So I'll just pause with those two slides, see if there's any questions at that point. Have you linked yep. into preparing for adulthood at all with that? Be yes. Yeah, so, so that's this kind of a, a transition piece of work, Ian, that's kind of, if you read um, quite a lot of the kind of outcomes in detail, and I'm happy to have a discussion with you in more detail, that, that, that preparing for out, adulthood and the transition is really important. And I think it's an area that we really need to work at, it, not really just 16 to 18, but that 16 to 25 kind of um, domain. Um I'd be interested to know also from you, Ian, what what you you know what the Together Trust is doing around that as well, and and whether we could work together on some of that. Um, so we're really keen to link the charter, so that the headings from the charter, which you'll see on the far left of this, these boxes, to the outcomes that young people said that they wanted so that link to feeling safe being loved and cared for hearing voice that voices being heard um 
I think a really there's some really strong statements in this link to outcomes. I think the one that comes through such a lot for me is my voice is heard and acted upon. And I think that's really important from Ian's, what Ian's just raised, especially as we've got young people going into adulthood, that we're listening and we're, we're adapting our plans for those young people. Um, and you can see that trust comes up in some of our outcomes. So, you know, all of you saying absolutely rightly that one of the important principles of co-production is trust. Actually, one of the important outcomes for children is trust, is that they want to feel trust in the people that they're working with, that are looking after them and that they're entrusting with their future. So I know that's quite a busy slide, but it's really nice um, visual of how we're linking across that kind of charter outcomes, because clearly what the Department for Education and CQC want to see when they come back and inspect us next year is that we actually have a real view of so what? So what difference have you made and how is that? And we have to be realistic. Change of culture takes years. It takes you know, five to 10 years. So we know this is a really long journey. We know we're not going to have solved this in two years. We may, It'll move as well. So that kind of constantly flexing, constantly, you know, uh, designing by doing and um, learning from the things that go well, but also learning from the things that don't go well as well. So I think it's really important that we have those outcomes in there. So I'm going to introduce Helen um, as one of our SEND champions, just to give us a little bit of an idea of her journey and what her work involves now. OK, Helen, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I'm Helen Lodge. Um, I got involved with being a SEND champion really um, when my own children were both diagnosed with additional needs um, and it was something I was interested in and it just grew and grew and sort of snowballed from there <laughs> where now I'm stuck in the thick of it um, I've been a nurse for many years many more than I want to say <laughs> and Claire approached me about doing a secondment with SEND within the trust to try and I suppose improve services so I've just moved over to the tree house and that's um, my new role at the moment um, as well as being a normal nurse on the ward um, so we did a new trust Facebook page for SEND which is called All About SEND um, which I found a really good way for parents, carers um, to sort of express what they needed, what was going wrong, what was working well um, and with the SEND champions as well, it's really helped to try and incorporate some new things in the short space of time that I've been doing it. Um, so we've now got the hidden disabilities products within the relevant areas um, of the trust, which have gone down really well. And we've had some really good feedback from that from the parents. Um, we're having more staff training, which um, has been developed by a number of, prof number of professionals, including speech and language. Um, Claire from Space, um, Cheryl Nuffer from the autism team. So hopefully that will be um, a running and rolling thing that will continue every year. Um, we've got things like some sensory grab bags that we're doing at the moment that we can have on the wards and on paediatric A&E for the children. Um, there's so many things going on all at once, I can't remember them all. Um, going forward, um, I think there's a lot of things that we want to do, but like Claire said, it, it takes time um, and there's lots of things that we can do. Um, the continuing for staff training, which I think is probably the biggest one and making staff aware of SEND around the trust. I think sometimes we take for granted that everyone knows what SEND is because we do it every day, but actually not everybody knows what it is. So it's making people aware and keeping that training up. Um, I think there is a need for more of a, a send link within the trust um, I think everything's a bit separated and maybe we need to look at having a bit more of a proper link so we can feed back things and and have that more time like you were saying with parents we can spend time with parents spend time with families and look at what we can do to help and improve things um, we're looking at things like so our play specialists on here are amazing and I don't think um they're praised enough and promoted enough for what they do. And they've actually done a lot of visual information sheets. So for parents, um, children that come in and that are struggling, you know, there's information, visual sheets for x-ray, for taking bloods, for going to theatre, 
there. So at the moment, we're just looking at sort of reorganising them, rejigging them a bit and having a couple of folders. So we've got one on children's A&E. It will be there soon. Um, so if children are worried, we have those visuals there that we can give to families to go through and have a look at. Um, the other big thing I know that Claire's keen at is in the future is looking at redesigning the ground floor of the tree house. And um, we've got some charity frog money um, and she's keen to spend that down there. So I think it would be really nice to get a little focus group of children, I think, or families um, to get an input of what they would want for down there. I think we're very good at doing focus groups for parents but we don't always involve the children so I'm quite keen to have quite a lot of children involved in that to see what they would like and what they what they would feel more comfortable having down there so there's loads of stuff going on and like I say if anyone wants to get involved um, you can either join the Facebook group um, or you can put in the chat and I'll send you my email and you can give me an email Thank you. I hope I've not waffled brilliant. on too much. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, Helen has made such a difference in such a small amount of time. So when she said I offered her a comment, literally I gave her a day, a week. <laughs> um, she used to work in the neonatal unit and, and I gave her a, and then she has uh, grabbed an opportunity to move to where obviously the heart of the action. So Helen's commitment to the service has been absolutely amazing. And I think she's absolutely right. What we need to do now is move on to how do we get young people involved in designing our space? We've got an opportunity. So when there was the frog, as Helen mentioned, when there was the frog um, uh, trail in Stockport, if you remember a couple of summers ago, they auctioned all the frogs off and all the money came to us. And I absolutely want to use that from everything. We've got really poor changing facilities for older children who might not be able to use traditional bathrooms. We've not got great, we haven't got a room that's that helps with children that might be a bit sensory overloaded while they're here. Um, some of our space is a bit open, isn't it? It feels a little bit daunting. Got a great garden, um, which we had a lot of money raised for a while ago. So I think it's that, it's getting young people involved in that. And Helen's role is absolutely yeah. important about raising that. And we also need to do that challenge. So we, we, we're, we're starting to move on to thinking about how we get organizations like ours uh, to pledge to do things so to me we should never um, write a job description design a new policy interview for somebody without having children and families involved in that decision and there's absolutely no reason why we can't do that we've done some really creative things anybody know what the family nurse partnership do they have a focus group of um, mums and babies who interview um, it, before the panel and they score um, the, the professional who comes in. They have to spend some time with mums and babies and toddlers and that they score them for, would you want them in your house? Would you want them working with your families? And I think we just need to really embrace that um, as all organisations. Um, and, and, and the local authority are doing that really well. We've recently appointed a, a really senior role with a, with a family panel. Uh, Michelle herself <laughs> went through that, didn't you, Michelle? So I think it's just embedding those kind of things because then we'll employ the right people with the right culture and we'll set them off knowing that that's how Stockport works. I think that's really important. It's worth yeah. just saying, Claire. So we, we, we're um, developing our recruitment strategy to make sure that all key roles have parent care and young people representation. And what we're finding is because we want it to be an organic process in the spirit of true co-production is that it's flexible enough to adapt each time. So mm -hmm. what we found was we went out with a really good plan to involve young people when we appointed our local offer coordinator, for example. And um, they were going to do a panel. They were going to meet the person, the people that were being interviewed individually asked their own questions and on the very day of the interview those young people became far too anxious and decided that they didn't want that to happen anymore so we adapted to that and we said fine you've already worked on your questions we'll ask them on your behalf if you're happy with that and feedback to you so they still got to have their involvement but it was in their way rather than us prescribing the way that things have to happen. And that's that kind of design by doing it. It's similar, isn't it, to one of our original pledges as a co-production work stream was to have a young person on our work stream. But actually, that is far too difficult um, for young people to get involved in. So it is about having that reference group and that feeding into the group instead. Sorry, for some reason, I put a sweet in my mouth while you were talking, Michelle. <laughs> I don't really know why. So our last slide is really just it. it I've, 
Oh, we've used this before. Oh, actually, I don't know if it's come up properly. Can everyone see that properly, or do you still get the old slide there? Yeah, we get the old slide. Oh, there you oh, go. Oh, there you go. It's coming up now. I think this is a great slide that that if you search the internet for user experience and design, this comes up many times. And James Brown, who was our previous um, CCG communications officer, used it. I think what it shows is that we as professionals might design that path. And we might think, God, that looks brilliant, great path. But actually what users do is they cut across the grass. <laughs> and what we've got to do is design our services to cut across the grass for them, you know, um, and to make that grass safe. So actually what would be unsafe for that is if you're a wheelchair user, but, but you might still decide to use it. So I think it's really important to think about what matters to people. If you think about the charter and how we want it to, to um, be used we want it to be used so that um, families children and young people and carers can take it as a piece of um, as a document to a meeting and say this is what matters to me and you've pledged to work to this charter so that's kind of the end of our presentation uh, we've got 10 minutes so i'm happy to take questions